right, well, I guess I'll start. Um, we're going to you know, talk about provisioning and deployment in a disconnected IoT world. Uh, my name is Doug Reynolds. I work for Carnegie Mellon University in their Software Engineering Institute department. If you want to call it a department, division, and uh, we work, I work in the uh, CERT area. Uh, some of you probably are familiar with US CERT. They, we kind of grew out of that, and my group's called the Secure Software, Secure Lifecycle Solutions Group, and we're sort of the DevOps evangelist people. Um, we go around and help people with DevOps solutions, process flows, and whatnot. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Here's a nice round of legal ease. And we'll kind of get to my introduction, which is what's a disconnected IoT device? What are we trying to accomplish here? And why did I decide to use SaltStack? Because I'm relatively new to the SaltStack game as well as some other people here I've talked to. So, what is a disconnected IoT device? Which is kind of an oxymoron since IoT is the Internet of Things, everything's connected. You're uploading, downloading, measuring, all kinds of fancy stuff. So in this case, we're taking a, kind of like a network of uh, SBC devices, which are like a uh, single board computer. And you normally deploy them out in a, uh, physically in a group or a cluster, depending on what you're trying to accomplish with that project. They're connected via an Ethernet switch, so they have connectivity with each other, but they have limited to no uplink, so you're, you're not going to go to you know, GitHub and download source code and compile or pull in projects. And these devices are set up to act as Docker hosts, mainly kind of like a, a microservice type of architecture. And they have different uh, functionality, some are for platform management, logging, sensors, um, I could go into more detail on the project, but unfortunately the, the nitty-gritty details is proprietary, so I'm limited on what I can say on the actual functionality of what the, uh, the networks are doing. So here's kind of a provisioning diagram. So this is kind of uh, my own recipe that I cooked up to make everything work. So. We have a, a salt master, you want to say a provisioning node. We have like your basic Ethernet switch. And then you have a bunch of SBC devices that you plug into the switch. And they can communicate within a private network, kind of with like a dual homed host set up on the master. And the master you know, can reach out and, and grab um, stuff from repositories, GitHub. but this might not always be the case, depending on if you're deploying out in the field. You know, if you're working in McMurdo, St McMurdo Station, Antarctica, there's probably not very good Wi-Fi down there, I'm, I'm assuming. I haven't been there, um, just as, as an example. So the idea is to kind of be the gateway, provide uh, the provisioning, and be able to, like, cache, pull down packages as needed. So I am not directly involved in a project, but the group who works on the project, they came to us and said, hey, we have, we need automation, like we need DevOps, like can you give us a pound of DevOps? Um, and we said, sure, we can, we can hook you up with some DevOps. So their, their idea is they got tired of like making ISO files and putting them on, you know, USB sticks, plugging them in clicking all the next buttons, making the LVM volumes. Um, their Docker images builds were kind of a manual thing. You had to enter your password to pull down Git repos like 300 times. Just kind of like it works, but it is not the simplest thing, especially if anybody's done like CD or CI. You know, you kind of want that stuff just to be nice and smooth and you just click a button. So the other thing is we had to build the actual images for microservices so that to take those Git repositories, build them, gather all the files, set the configurations, and then push them up to these individual devices. 
And depending on what they're doing, they might have 20 devices, they might have 30 devices. So as you can see, this turns out to be a very uh, lengthy process, and especially if you don't have 20 interns to work for you. So we're in a university, you always have interns when school's out, but you don't, you know, you don't always have interns. So why did I use SaltStack? So our group was mainly uh, a chef group. So all of our stuff was done with like Chef Solo or depending on what we we're doing. And my experiences with Chef were, were okay. Like I've done Chef, but the first thing I noticed with Chef is it takes forever. Maybe it's just Chef Solo or the art configuration, but it would take like 30, 45 seconds to run Chef. And the other thing that with Chef is like not everybody uses Chef. So you have people using Puppet, you have people using nothing at all, you have um, Ansible. So we're trying, our group is trying to give, get experience so we can understand how to help our customers with what sort of needs that they have. The other thing was, is with Salt, you have kind of security cooked in out of the box. You have you know, all your passwords are encrypted over a AES link over the, the zero MQ, and you can put on TLS if you just generate your certificates for your environment, and you can have message signing so you can validate your messages are legitimately from that minion. And most of our group, we do a lot of Python work, so, you know, Flask, Django, um, all those nice Python scripts and whatnot, so, you know, we're all familiar with that, so if we have to like go in and dig in code, we don't have to like translate, you know, Python to Ruby or, you know, which is what Chef is using or whatever, you know, other types of languages you have. And you're dealing with YAML. YAML is a simple syntax. It's convertible to JSON. A lot of people use it. Most of us are pretty familiar. I'm sure everybody who's used YAML, you know, is been frustrated with that one a time or two, but it's better than XML, right? So this is starting out on my provisioning trip. So chapter one, we take Vagrant, SaltStack, Fabric, and Debian preceding, which we'll get into that in a little bit. So Vagrant's kind of a nice tool if anybody, anybody use Vagrant? Okay, so you're familiar, some of you are familiar, but it's kind of like a way a developer can set up a VM on their local system. You can mimic production. Um, they recently added, uh, I think in the last year or so, a uh, default provisioning option. So it will install SaltStack on your VM, set up your proxies. The only, the only downfall is if you're trying to, in my case, if you're trying to manage a whole bunch of devices that are gonna have you know, an individual key for the master and the minions, you kind of need to store that. So I was able to take and write a custom script to kind of like either use the keys outside of the box or if you're just doing a scratch throwaway, it would create keys for your salt stack configuration. And if you can see here, I know it's probably fine, fine print, but there's a simple script that just kind of generates some keys and says, hey, do we have keys? No, let's make some keys, et cetera. Nothing too elaborate, and it's a, it's a nice tool, and it, it makes things a lot easier to automate, and if you have a base image that, you know, some folks have a base image from their IT department, they could take that, load it into VirtualBox, create a simple box file, install your custom, you know, if, like if you're a developer and you use Vim, you probably have a bunch of Vim packages or you know, custom scripts, aliases, shortcuts, you can plug that into a box and then it'll just spin that up and it'll just be like you're, you know, ready to start developing. And some more into the salt stack configuration Vagrant. So I was talking about my key management. Well, Vagrant also has a triggers function. So when you, you can trigger based on provisioning VMs, starting VMs, different types of, uh, states in the VM provisioning and boot up logic so you can have it execute something. So I just on boot of that box or on provisioning, I kick out and run my script and it'll execute, make sure the keys are, are there. 
And this section of uh, a vagrant file here shows kind of like your default simple salt configuration, install your salt master, your minion keys, and it also shows an example of a, a trigger execution. And the nice thing about Vagrant is it gives you an option, say for some reason you're doing testing and you don't want to run a high state right out of provisioning, then you can flip an option and say don't run high state. There's a low state option, which you can also run, which I'm not 100% sure what exactly that's for. I keep reading through the state documents, but I'm, you know, I don't know, maybe somebody can enlighten me afterwards um, if you're familiar with that. So just a nice, easy way. You don't have to get your hands dirty and manually install your salt master when you create a VM. So that kind of gets you up and running with, you have your, your VM in your environment. So uh, I don't know how many people here are developers versus admins. So has anybody ever created a slipstreamed Windows disk or a preceded Linux or Kickstart? So if you've done pre-seeds, you know that that is not super fun. And Kickstart, uh, Debian, sometimes some of Debian also supports Kickstart scripts, but those are kind of like transpiled from Kickstart into pre-seed. So that's always fun. So part of that is getting the precinct to work on your image and building the image and make sure you can boot the image with EFI or non-EFI and there's a lot of different options and it takes a long time to get right and so knowing that I'm handing this off to another team that's going to build these images and they probably, they're developers, they probably haven't made a pre-seed file or built an ISO, that's why they're asking us for some help. I use Fabric. Fabric's a Python. It's a, some people would consider it an automation tool. If you're a Ruby person, it's similar to Capistrano, but it allows you to define functions as tasks, and it'll kind of step through, you know, a list of execution steps in Python, and you can do different things. It kind of gives a nice wrapper around the sub-process um, functions you can shell out run a command, you can SSH. So Fabric, that gives a nice um, wrapper to say, complete each one of these steps one by one to build my CD, build my ISO image. And that way you don't have to go back and try to remember what, you know, uh, Exorius command that you have to run to like put the EFI framework or the EFI uh, image right on the right spot of the CD or all the different options to like pack all your files and to make your RAM disks. If you've ever made, if you've never made a Linux RAM disk to, for boot, I suggest you do it. It's a fantastically fun process. Um, notice my uh, sarcasm there. Um, and then naturally in my any file, so Fabric will let you pass in uh, variables and options. And this is kind of like a, a quick uh, example. So. I use salts, file manage to make a Jinja template to put those values in. So if somebody has to go back in you know, six months and change some sort of IP address, network configuration, you know, they can go back in, just change, do that value, run the high state, and just recreate the CD-ROM and the, it will you know, update those um, values in the actual template itself. And it's, you know, Fabric's just a simple command. You just run fab, and then you run the step that you want to execute, and those can combine multiple steps, or you can run them all depending on how you, you know, you build your execution package. So chapter two of provisioning, that was mainly kind of get us, get us going so we don't have people having to select, uh, this is the time zone Eastern, and keep hitting next. So you now have a USB disk. If you stick it in a device, you boot it up, and it boots to that device, it's gonna wipe everything off of it and lay down a nice, fresh version of the operating system. And you just have to make sure you don't plug it in something that you actually need because it'll erase everything, which is kind of the purpose, but you know, details, details. So we move on to chapter two, which is uh, Pixie booting services and device configuration. So another part of this is 
So if I have to make 20 devices, I really don't want to make 20 USB keys because that takes a while. I don't know if you've done DD to a USB key, but if you get stuck with one of those old USB keys, it takes like 20 minutes. And then if you have to make 20 more of them, it kind of gets pretty ugly. So if you've done Pixie installations or you haven't, it's just a simple, it's, it's uh, Intel's uh, protocol. It's a pre-boot execution environment. So it will ping for the network. The DHCP server will issue down a few paths and commands and an IP address. And then the BIOS or the EFI network will go out and grab that uh, boot file and it'll boot the system. And hopefully you're, if you do it right, the boot file will have the necessary information it needs to pull down and start your OS installation. If you're if you've done bare metal configuring or provisioning, I'm sure there's a lot of people who have done that. You know, I'm traditionally a software developer, so I don't do a lot of Pixie booting, so it was kind of a fun experience. But just to round it up, you need uh, some sort of DHCP server. You need a TA TFTP daemon, which is your trivial, trivial file, pro or file transfer protocol. Um, in this case, I use DNS mask to be, have a DNS server. I use Apache to go in and host my non-boot uh, image files, so any additional files, Apache will serve them out. And I like to throw an NTP daemon because I don't know how many times I've went into a box and the time's drifting, or I just like to have my time correct. That's, you know, that's the only thing, you know, we can hit a satellite GPS and get the right time. That's, you know, I, got, I have simple goals. Just make, just tell me the right time. If you've noticed at the bottom of the screen, I have a little, a uh, couple little tips on some of the slides. So um, I just kind of threw those out for people who are watching and reading. But in this case, DNS mask will provide a full DHCP um, and Pixie with uh, T TFTPD, but I've used DHCPD since like 2000, the year 2000, and I've used that, those tools before, and so I kind of stuck with what I knew. And it's kind of good because what I have done with DNS mask, it seems like it's quirky, and it does most of the things what you expect, but there's always some weird edge case and you go and you Google Stack Exchange and it's like, oh yeah, in this version you have to do this because there was a, kind of this weird bug, so if you upgrade to the next version it works fine, but then it breaks something else. So your mileage may vary on that. So additional services on the box. So I installed App Mirror to mirror down Debian repos. So it will basically, you give it a configuration, it will go up and pull down you know, a repo that's in Debian format and it'll lay it out on a disk so you can have a local mirror. And I also included Apache just for like a sample Apache configuration to set up um, Apache. And another tool I pulled in here is Squid. So when you're dealing with devices that don't talk to the internet, you don't want to necessarily give them the logic to know how to talk to the internet. So you kind of give it a translation layer. And so Squid's kind of like the intermediary that I say, I point it to Squid, and Squid knows what to do with the request. And naturally, since we're dealing with Git and we're dealing with offline capabilities, I installed the Git server module so I can kind of host my own Git repos on the system. And one thing I like about Salt, the, the configuration's pretty straightforward. Um, it serves out all the files. Chef similar, um, Ansible similar. You know that's the kind of base functionality you expect from uh, some sort of provisioning tool. So we move on to actually configuring the device. So we start with a Pixie process and we get the operating system installed, and that's kind of like a no-brainer with installing an OS. And then when the devices come up, they're all under DHCP since they don't really know what they're doing yet. So in order to kind of roll this all together, I created a Python script that uses the SALT API. And there's, SALT has a few different APIs. But the goal is I want to look and see, you know, if you add a new system to SALT, you have to accept it first. You have to take the public key and say, hey, I 
validate this public key, kind of like adding somebody to your GPG key ring. And originally I started off with using just salt key and doing a subprocess because I hadn't dug into the API docs as much. But then I found the Wheel API, which is um, salts basically their API for administration functions. And there's probably 50 different functions in there, but I happen to use um, a specific one. But basically, I go into that API, I pull for available dy dynamic host names, I accept the, the key, then I run the high state down on the um, device, and then that will push down Docker, any new configuration, update all the packages in case there was some sort of uh, delay since the last uh, ISO was created and there's security updates. And then I have a, a custom state apply. So depending on what static IP address I want for that, I pass that in to a special uh, SLS file. And what that will do is it pushes down the network configuration. And if you run Docker, it pushes down the, the bridge for the Ethernet because Docker has to bridge over for the network. And then I do a nice, uh, what I consider a slightly clever tactic. Um, so you have a bunch of these devices laying around. You really don't have a way to ID them. And they're all, you don't have your, the application is expecting kind of like a static set of host names. So if you have, you could have, you know, 10 or a couple devices with the same name. So to kind of make this a little more sane, I provision each of the minion ID with a GUID in its name and that kind of gives it like a unique identifier. So when you plug it back into the system, it's not trying to fight because the keys are different or get that kind of error where it says, hey, this box says it's supposed to have this key, but it doesn't. So that kind of gives like a, not a, a totally random, but a, a distinct way to, to plug in a device and understand what that device is. And then network manage changes the IP address, and then I do a simple uh, reboot command so I can set an at job, and then the at job, um, which is similar to a cron, but it's kind of like an ad hoc where you can execute a command in a certain amount of time, and that at job changes that minion ID and it reboots the system. That way, we don't have to worry about losing the network during the high state because if your network drops, then you're gonna have issues because you're not gonna have a good status and you're not gonna know the actual outcome. Then the provisioning tool waits until it sees that new minion name that I gave it come back on the network and I accept it. And then that way I consider it provisioned. So if you stick it in a system, the system will know about it and it'll say, okay, I, I can send you know, device updates to it, I can send images to it and whatnot. So I was talked earlier about the uh, wheel client. So here's a quick example I threw together that kind of gives you a, an idea on what kind of the options you need to run with this. So basically you create the client from the configuration. You give it a command, in this case, key list all, which that says go into my key repository and give me a list of all the minions and their keys. And then this is an example where it'll give you different results for if you have a minion that's you know, an active minion or if it's rejected, denied, or if it's just unaccepted. And that's kind of a way you can go there and you know, kind of get a list of what you have on your network key-wise. Then the last part of the command, it just says, hey, here's this host, just say, accept this, and I want to put it in my key escrow and say, hey, I know this host, this is my host. And again on here, a uh, few had uh, seen Drew Malone's presentation earlier. Um, apparently there's a, they have a nice hook in there if you can go back and look at the video, but um, it'll tell you exactly, it's like a salt uses it to um, decide on how the API commands are, whether they're successful or unsuccessful. But the full return command code here actually gives a nice little block that says, return code zero, and that says that, hey, this process was successful versus a non-zero, which means it failed for some reason. So it's kind of a way you can say, I know for sure this was good. So on to building containers, which everybody loves to do if you've done Docker. Well, at least you like it after you figure out how to, to make them uh, build correctly. 
So this is kind of my before and after process. Um, containers are relatively interesting. In the early days of Docker, you had to make your, your com compilation and build environment in a separate container. You had to mount your source code within the actual container. Then you had to run the container to execute you know, GCC or whatever sort of uh, compiler you have. You know, or if you're doing some sort of you know, Python wheel build or you know, whatever Java compile. Then you have to take that output put it onto your volume, and then drop out of the container and go over the Docker build process and include that um, file that you just built, your executable, into the new image while you create the new image. And then when you're all done, hopefully it works, but at the end, you're like, uh, what happened because this didn't work? And then um, in this case, like whoever put the, the original build script together for these containers was a sharp guy. But, and it worked, but I honestly, I would sit there and whiteboard it on because there was copying things, there was moving, there was special directories, like some sort of Python thing that didn't do anything, but it was still running it. And I'm like, I, yeah, I'm not, maybe I'm not the smartest guy here, but like this is way too complicated if you're trying to like make something simple. So in the last couple of years, Docker released what they call multi-stage build. So. What that allows you to do is you define your build container in the same Docker file as your running container. So what that does is you can have a special container with all your um, dash dev packages and all your libraries and all the header files. Build all that stuff and then you have that kind of in memory or on disk. And then when you go to build your image you just say copy from and then it'll just copy those files over. So now you have a single step and you don't have to worry about this weird complex system that has like 20 different steps and then you can be happy about it and not lose your mind when it breaks. And that also takes some of the complexity out of having like a templated actual building system so you don't have to follow like a lot of draconian weird rules that you don't understand why they're there. You can just put all your logic within the Docker file and execute it there. And if you also need to, you can pull in things to execute in a Docker file if you need something special. And my tip from here is you can actually name your stages. So if you want to have a Docker file with 20 different stages on it, and you need to like execute one of them, the stages, or start from a stage, you can tell Docker to say, hey, start at this stage. And you can say, start at the build stage, or the you know, create wheel package stage, or whatever stage you want. And then it'll start from there instead of running the whole stage, which is nice if, you, you know, if it takes 20, 30 minutes to build a container. So now down to the deployment. So deployment's always interesting, but in this aspect, it's once you have the image on the Docker host, you basically run an export, and that makes a tar file. And then with those tar files, I, Salt has its own built-in server that all, everybody can talk to, so you just put it under the Salt root and mount up a folder in there and put all your images there, and now all the systems can see the images. So also using the, the Docker local client, you can query the system and grab, find out all the images that are out there already. So I take that, loop through those, and build up a manifest of what I want to send down to the box on image-wise, which I have kind of predefined on all the services that are available. And then once I decide which, which system needs what, I take Docker load and I loop through each image. And the nice thing about, that is, is Docker load, you give it a list of hosts. So if you have 20 hosts and only four of them have an old image, then you just tell it the four and then those will parallel, in parallel download the image from the server and install it. So you don't have to waste cycles trying to push, force push the image down to each device. And then when that, once that process is done, then I go in and using the same concept, I tag the images with latest and some build designation to help you understand when they were built. And then one thing I will notice is if you're running a provisioning or you're transferring an image of several gigabytes, that the default API timeout will time out because it might take five minutes to transfer an image. So you have to be careful on that. And then also if you're 
connecting over a switch that's you know 100 meg or less, those will also take longer. So since this is more of a prototype project, I would probably this is, works fine. Just set the timeout larger because you're there watching it. But in a production environment, you have command async from Docker or from Salt, so you could execute the async command. And I don't know the details of it, but either poll for the result or you could uh, get a callback from it, depending on how I've been wanting to, to take a look at that. And the future of this, maybe what I get pulled into is everybody here's Kubernetes. That's the new hotness on everybody. I went to OzCon this year, and literally like every session was like how you can like make your cats like feed their fe feed your cats feed bowls with cat food in Kubernetes or like put everything in Kubernetes, like document your Kubernetes. Kubernetes is like, it's awesome, it does everything, but not everybody needs Kubernetes. I'm gonna throw that out there. Um, Docker Compose is always an option. When it originally started, Docker Compose was more of a, uh, this is more of a dev tool, like, I don't know if we wanna like use Docker Compose in production, but now I guess it's kind of okay. And, uh, According to Docker, at least, Swarm is not dead. Um, so Swarm is another option. Um, everybody says Swarm is dead, but uh, numerous people from Docker says we continue to add features to Swarm. We also support all of our clients. We have major customers using Swarm. So is it gonna go away? Don't know, but it's an option if you just need simple orchestration with not having to install like a nine host Kubernetes cluster and go you know, hog, hog wild with that. Because literally, you, know, you can install Istio, different frameworks, you know, sidecars, you know, whatever. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. So uh, on here, so I have some final thoughts on this. And, and this isn't probably your standard, like, hey, this is how you can use Saw to like, make all your problems go away. This is basically how Somebody gives me a problem and says, hey, we need you to solve this somehow, and we're only gonna give you, it's kinda like your, uh, this is kinda like your side project, so do this while you're doing other things, so, you know, you know I'm not, I'm hardly a system architect, so, you know, people give me things and I make things work. That's, I'm, I always can say I'm kinda like the computer janitor of software engineering. I just, needs to work, so make it work. And try to make it work so people understand it in the future. So final thoughts are is when you're doing new and exciting things or old and not so exciting things is try to leverage developer tools and virtualizations. People go out there like Vagrant, they create these tools. You know, a lot of people just, I know that I work with, they just don't like look for things. A lot of times if you have a problem, you know, somebody else already made a module 20 years ago and put it on CPAN, but nobody forgot about it because nobody looks on CPAN. Perl, if anybody wrote Perl back in the day. Um, so the other thing is start with your low-hanging fruit. What can you do to make things easier fast? And in my case, I started out with making the pre-seed operating system because that's something that I can hand off to, hand a USB stick to somebody. They can burn that, hand it all to the team members, burn it. They can just set it and forget it, and then you know, come back an hour later from lunch and they don't, they don't have to press the OK button, select EST. Yes, I want my password to be this or that or whatnot. The other thing is automate things. Like if you have to do things twice, you better automate them. And I know a lot of people may disagree or agree, but if you do things once and it's complex, you better think about doing it again, just automating it because there's a chance again that you're gonna like make one mistake and you're gonna have to do it all over anyways. Or somebody's gonna come back to you in two years and they say, hey, you know that thing you did like two years ago that you probably don't remember? Can you do that again for us? Cause something broke. So, uh, you know, not pointing any fingers, you know. Or any <laughs> but the other thing is embrace a network. Um, I work with a lot of software engineers. The network is like, oh, that's the network people's department. Um, Part of software engineering is like maybe not everybody are uh, socket programmers to program high-speed APIs, but you know everything's connected now, so you need to understand how everything works. And I know everybody gets the 
seven layers of the OSI framework that you need to like pull out and you're gonna have to look at them, but you, you really need to incorporate that in your process because you know, everything runs on a network now. You, you, can't, you can't really uh, avoid it. The other thing is a lot of, like use APIs because when I started this, I was like, ah, I could whip together some bad scripts, do a little complex things and you know, then it starts getting ugly because uh, like my first uh, provisioning project was in 2011 and that was before uh, infrastructure's code tools were something popular. And they're like, hey, you know a lot of bash here. Like, we need you to do this giant list of stuff, and we need it to, like, happen automatically. And let me tell you, that's a lot of bash code, and it gets kind of rough because bash does not fail nicely. And the other key is with the APIs is you can always read the API documents, but a lot of these things in the salt API, I didn't get the inside scoop until, you know, I went into Visual Studio Code, hit the F11 on the command or the thing, and drilled in to see what the options were or if you're an IntelliJ person, the command B, either way. The other thing is don't be af afraid to throw away code. I think that's a good goal for anybody who's writing any sort of code. Just because it's your baby, it's not an actual baby. Throw it out with the bathwater. If it's not good, you know, it's something that may need to be going. And I know a lot of people have their pet projects. I know I have, and you're like, but I worked so hard on that. It's just code. It can go away. You can replace it with something. Um, the other thing is test, test your results because a lot of the infrastructure's code and, and random testing is you need to test and you need to test over and over and over and over again. And then my way of solving this problem is not necessarily your way, so like I'm no expert on how to do some weird random task and when people come to you with suggestions and ideas, you know, that's, hey, one person has a different way of thinking and it's not right or it's not wrong. But if it works in the end and people can understand it, it's a solution. And the other thing is my kitty's always watching, so um, I don't think a good presentation is good without a, a cat picture. But anyways, uh, if anybody has any questions, um, I'm open for questions. I know it's uh, a lot to go through and I probably had way too much caffeine and Monster. Um, so.